Why does God allow earthquakes, tornadoes, hurricanes, tsunamis, typhoons, cyclones, mudslides, wildfires, and other natural disasters? Tragedies like the 2023 earthquake in Turkey and Syria cause many people to question God's goodness. It is distressing that natural disasters are often termed acts of God, while no credit is given to God for years, decades, or even centuries of peaceful weather. God created the whole universe and the laws of nature. Most natural disasters are a result of these laws at work. Hurricanes, typhoons, and tornadoes are the results of divergent weather patterns colliding. Earthquakes are the result of the Earth's plate structure shifting. A tsunami is caused by an underwater earthquake. What happened in Jerusalem shocked the whole world. Yes, an earthquake. Did it destroy the Dome of the Rock? What will happen in the future? Let's dive deeper into today's video to discover the damage of this phenomenon. Watch till the end of this video so you don't miss any information. The Dome of the Rock is perhaps the most iconic symbol of the city of Jerusalem. Its golden dome stands out above the rooftops of the city, majestic, mysterious, and magnificent. The Dome of the Rock was built on Temple Mount, a hill within the walls of Jerusalem's old city in 688, 691, by Caliph Abd el-Malik. The Dome of the Rock remains Jerusalem's most recognized landmark and a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The Dome of the Rock stands on Temple Mount in the southeastern corner of the Old City. It was here that the first temple stood from the 10th century until 587 BC. The second temple was built in 516 BC and was destroyed in 70 AD. Temple Mount has been held sacred by Christians, Muslims, and Jews for thousands of years, and the exact location where the Dome of the Rock stands has special significance. For Christians and Jews, the rock over which the Dome of the Rock stands is where Abraham nearly sacrificed his son Isaac to prove his faith in God. For Muslims, the same story is told, but instead of Isaac, Abraham planned to sacrifice his son Ishmael. Jews also hold this site sacred, as it was where the Ark of the Covenant with the Ten Commandments tablets was kept in the inner sanctum of the ancient temple. For Muslims, the shrine holds the rock from which the Prophet Muhammad stepped up to heaven. It is also believed that he founded Islam at this exact site. The Dome of the Rock is one of the oldest surviving Islamic monuments. It is not a mosque, but a shrine. Sharing the Temple Mount with the Dome of the Rock is the Al-Aqsa Mosque, believed to be where the Prophet traveled on his night journey as told in the Quran. For all of these reasons, the site where the Dome of the Rock stands is believed to be where the divine presence of God exists more than any other place in the world. Uh, this place is very important, right exactly, so it's also the reason why you will be shocked by the news that I reveal right now. Pieces of mosaics containing anti-Christian verses from the Quran began falling off the facade of the Dome of the Rock. A mosaic tile was falling off the western facade of the Dome of the Rock, located on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Why did it happen? Jerusalem experienced an earthquake that devastated the city. The earthquake shook Israel and shook Jerusalem. Structural damage was reported at a Muslim structure on the Temple Mount. Though the damage seems minor and its cause is undetermined, the Muslim structures standing on Judaism's holiest site have a long history of collapse due to the earthquakes that are common to the region. Yes, it's exactly the Dome of the Rock. The ceramic tile measured approximately 20 centimeters square. The media noted similar incidents when stones fell in the interior of the Aqsa Mosque, the grey dome structure at the southern end of the Temple Mount. Constructed in 692 CE by the Umayyad Caliphate on the orders of Abd al-Malik on the site of the Jewish Temple, the current shrine is the oldest Muslim structure in existence. 
The architecture and mosaics were patterned after nearby Byzantine Christian churches and palaces and using the measurements of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. The Crusaders captured Jerusalem in 1099 and the Dome of the Rock was given to the Augustinians who turned it into a church. Jerusalem was recaptured by Saladin in 1187 and the Dome of the Rock was reconsecrated as a Muslim shrine. During the reign of Suleiman the Magnificent, the exterior of the Dome of the Rock was covered with tiles. The building was severely damaged by earthquakes in 808 and again in 846. The dome collapsed in an earthquake in 1015 and was rebuilt in 1022. The mosaics on the drum were repaired in 1027. The earthquake of 1033 resulted in the introduction of wooden beams to enforce the dome. Parts of the Dome of the Rock collapsed during the 1927 earthquake and the walls were left badly cracked. The structure is actually built on an ancient underground complex. At the center of the Dome of the Rock is a large flat foundation stone. According to Jewish tradition, that is where God sent Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. Underneath the stone, is an empty chamber called the Well of Souls. In that chamber is a type of manhole that leads down to a tunnel. No one has ever explored that tunnel and it is believed that it was used as part of the temple. It is even possible that the Ark of the Covenant is in that tunnel. Why does God allow natural disasters? The Bible proclaims that Jesus Christ holds all of nature together. Could God prevent natural disasters? Absolutely. Does God sometimes influence the weather? Yes, as we see in Deuteronomy 11.17 and James 5.17. Number 16.30-34 shows us that God sometimes causes natural disasters as a judgment against sin. The book of Revelation describes many events which could definitely be described as natural disasters. But is every natural disaster a punishment from God? Absolutely not. In much the same way that God allows evil people to commit evil acts, God allows the earth to reflect the consequences sin has had on creation. Romans 8, 19, 21 tells us, The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in the hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. The fall of humanity into sin had effects on everything, including the world we inhabit. Everything in creation is subject to frustration and decay. Sin is the ultimate cause of natural disasters, just as it is the cause of death, disease, and suffering. Have the opportunity to help minister, counsel, pray, and lead people to saving faith in Christ. God can and does bring great good out of terrible tragedies. God's purpose for earthquakes. Earthquakes take a prominent place in the Bible. They can be formidable as they swallow landscape, destroy infrastructure, and take human lives. Yet the Bible isn't reluctant to speak of them. That's why I want to present the biblical purpose of earthquakes, especially as it regards huge earthquakes. There are parts of creation that at first glance appear to be misjudgments of God. The wobble in the earth, straying meteors in the heavens, hurricanes, tsunamis, and tornadoes. Initially, all of these matters seem to impugn the wisdom and goodness of God, and each disaster deserves a biblical explanation. In times of calamity, two scriptures especially help us understand God's strange work. The first is found in Revelation 4.11. John writes, You are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and they exist because you created what you pleased. And then Paul writes these words in Colossians 1.16. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, 
visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. The God who is infinitely wise could have laid the earth's foundation in such a way that it would never tremble. But he chose to fashion the earth's tectonic plates precisely as they are. They exist because he created what he pleased, and the Lord created them for himself. Earthquakes occur to satisfy God's justice. One of the recurring themes of that formidable book of Revelation regards God's justice during the apocalypse. John repeatedly writes of how God's judgments are just and right, all of them. At one point, as God issues his wrath upon the world, the 24 elders that surround God's throne in heaven interrupt John's writing to ascribe worship and praise toward God for his judgments on the earth. And the 24 elders, who were seated on their thrones before God, fell on their faces and worshipped God, 17, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. 18. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead and for rewarding your servants, the prophets, and your people who revere your name, both great and small, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. Theologians have noted that earthquakes are the surest sign of God's judgment, and there is a reason for this. It is because earthquakes occur without warning and offer no time for preparation. While other natural disasters can occur with advance notice, in an instant an earthquake arrives, rattles the earth, and then disappears. Notice that God identifies with earthquakes. As reckoning as earthquakes can be, no scripture suggests Satan ignites them. Several fearsome scriptures show how God visits the earth in earthquakes. In no uncertain terms, the Lord has identified himself with the earthquake. But why? Why did God create the earth susceptible to earthquakes? Earthquakes and other natural disasters seem to malign his integrity. Even Amos 3, 6 dares to announce, When disaster comes to a city, has not the Lord caused it? Earthquakes always redound to God's eternal purposes. We must always remember that it is impossible for God to act or react contrary to his nature. In all things, whether catastrophic or marvelous, God never acts capriciously or without forethought. In fact, the Bible shows that God has judiciously planned his works toward mankind ages ago, perhaps thousands of years ago, when the foundations of the world were laid. Despite how our human thinking appraises circumstances, God cannot author anything apart from his perfect wisdom and forethought. Our God possesses infinite knowledge, infinite wisdom, and infinite purposes. This is why his ways are often inscrutable and murky to humans, but that doesn't mean we cannot trust him. Beyond the disasters that befall this sinful world, there is a good and all-wise God that we can trust in accordance with Ephesians 1.11, which says he works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. In all things regarding this life, God's acts always meet two objectives. They function for his glory and man's good, and he's even working on behalf of sinners. Again, it's the prophet that says this in Isaiah 26, 9, 10. When your judgments come upon the earth, the people of the world learn righteousness. 10. But when grace is shown to the wicked, they do not learn righteousness, even in a land of uprightness, they go on doing evil and do not regard the majesty of the Lord. God loves sinners so much that he afflicts the earth with trembling so that their souls will look to him for salvation. The Bible overflows with testimony of God's love, goodness, mercy, salvation, justice, and wisdom. And he always includes these verities of his character when he arises to shake the earth. The gift of God's Son, Jesus Christ, is proof enough that he overflows with grace, mercy, compassion, 
and love. We are not sure that this is God's punishment, but do you believe that it is a sign of God's return? What signs indicate that the end times are approaching? In Matthew 24, 5, 8, Jesus gives us some important clues for discerning the approach of the end times. Many will come in my name, claiming I am the Christ, and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. An increase in false messiahs, an increase in warfare, and increases in famines, plagues, and natural disasters. These are signs of the end times. In this passage, though, we are given a warning. We are not to be deceived because these events are only the beginning of birth pains. The end is still to come. Some interpreters point to every earthquake, every political upheaval, and every attack on Israel as a sure sign that the end times are rapidly approaching. While the events may signal the approach of the last days, they are not necessarily indicators that the end times have arrived. The Apostle Paul warned that the last days would bring a marked increase in false teaching. The Spirit clearly says that in later times some will abandon their faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. The last days are described as perilous times because of the increasingly evil character of man and people who actively oppose the truth. Other possible signs of the end times would include the rebuilding of a Jewish temple in Jerusalem, increased hostility toward Israel, and advances toward a one-world government. The most prominent sign of the end times, however, is the nation of Israel itself. In 1948, Israel was recognized as a sovereign state, essentially for the first time since 605 BC, when the Babylonians took control of Judah. God promised Abraham that his posterity would have Canaan as an everlasting possession, and Ezekiel prophesied a physical and spiritual resuscitation of Israel. Having Israel as a nation in its own land is important in light of the end times prophecy because of Israel's prominence in eschatology. With these signs in mind, we can be wise and discerning in regard to the expectation of the end times. We should not, however, interpret any of these singular events as a clear indication of the soon arrival of the end times. God has given us enough information that we can be prepared, and that is what we are called to be as our hearts cry out, Come, Lord Jesus! The importance of living a purposeful life. As we prepare for the return of Jesus Christ, it is essential to live a purposeful life that aligns with our spiritual and moral values. Many people spend their lives searching for meaning and purpose, and the return of Jesus Christ can provide us with a sense of direction and purpose. Firstly, living a purposeful life means focusing on the things that matter most. It involves identifying our values and aligning our actions with those values. When we live a purposeful life, we are more intentional in our decisions and we are less likely to get distracted by things that do not align with our values. This allows us to live a more meaningful and fulfilling life, which can bring us closer to God. Secondly, living a purposeful life means working towards a greater good. As we prepare for the return of Jesus Christ, we must strive to make the world a better place. This means using our gifts and talents to help others, advocating for social justice and protecting the environment. By working towards a greater good, we are fulfilling our purpose and making a positive impact in the world. Thirdly, living a purposeful life means taking responsibility for our actions. We must be accountable for the choices we make and the impact they have on others. By living with integrity and transparency, we build trust and respect, which are essential 
in creating a more just and equitable society. Living a purposeful life also means cultivating healthy relationships with others. As Christians, we are called to love our neighbors as ourselves and to treat others with kindness and compassion. This means taking the time to build meaningful connections with family, friends, and community members and extending that love and care to those in need. By nurturing healthy relationships with others, we create a supportive network that can help us navigate life's challenges and contribute to a more harmonious society. What was evident in the recent earthquakes was the level of faith of the people. An old lady was asking for a scarf to cover her head before she could be pulled out of the rubble. A man was pulled out after some days while reciting the Noble Quran. An old man was asking for water to make wudhu to read Salah, even while still stuck among the concrete slabs. This is a lesson for us to never write off anyone. This is even more applicable to Turkey, where the signs of Islam were suppressed in the secularist agenda from the 1920s Adnan Menderes was the Prime Minister of Turkey from 1950. He was tried and hanged by the army for legalizing the Athen which had been banned, reopening thousands of masjids across the country, and saying that there would be no problem in restoring the Khilafah if the people wished. Today the tables have been turned, and the resurgence of Islam in public life in Turkey is evident everywhere. Where once there was little sign of Islam, it is now flourishing. You can never know how a person can change their life for the better, so never write anyone off. Thank you so much for watching. That's all about today's video. If you like this video, please give us a like. Don't forget to subscribe and turn on the notification bell to watch the latest videos from our channel. Hope to see you in the next videos. Goodbye.